Hello YouTube, you already know what it is. We're going through the Footsie's Handbook. Let's just get right into it. Uh, we're probably gonna go through two chapters today because I think these ones are, I don't really need to show big examples. I think they're a little straightforward. But yeah, the, we're gonna go start with chapter five because I think chapter four is a little less relevant to Street Fighter VI, but it's still good. But we'll start with the good stuff. Chapter five, one of the oldest textbook guidelines in Street Fighter is don't jump. That's been true since the beginning with Street Fighter II World Warriors and it's still true today. When you jump toward your opponent, you surrender control of the joystick for two whole seconds. Think about that. I mean, it's probably like one second, right? Let's find out. Let's find out. Boom. 45 frames. Not even a full second, but, you know, it's still a long time. As you notice, I had to mod in Android 18 because I'm just tired of waiting for Dragon Ball Fighters rollback. So I'm just going to play her in this game. Um, anyway. Hopefully, stating it in, the, in those terms reveals the massive risk inherent in jumping. You're essentially gambling with the momentum of the match every time you try it. True. I mean, it's a little less risky if you're Kami, you know, we got a dive kick privilege. Anyway, however, the confusing part of accepting this advice is that jumping can secretly can be secretly good in special instances when set up properly. The real predicament is knowing how and when to jump. If you don't know, then you're better off adhering to don't jump. So yeah, all this is true, I think. Every time you jump, just know that you're taking a huge risk. And because of that, you want to build your play around the ground game because it's just safer. It's more, it's risk free and it's not risk free. It's less risky. You'll build your fundamentals way stronger if you have a good ground game and you realize I'm going to jump for specific reasons. If you're ever jumping and your only goal is I want to get in and I don't know anything else, then you're probably taking risks that you don't have to be taking. Anyway, give your opponent a good reason to throw a fireball and jump over it. Do you see how this concept revolves around what they want to do as opposed to what you want to do? Yeah, exactly like I said. It'll only work if you successfully establish without a shadow of a doubt that you don't need to jump to win. Watch how Daigo waits 65 ticks of game time before jumping forward at Watson. In fact, he makes it through the set's entire first round plus 50 seconds of the second round without ever leaving the ground. How long do you spend observing your opponent's rhythm before taking that chance? But like I was saying, you need to jump for a reason. Like, I don't remember this clip. But if Daigo never jumps and Watson is just comfortable throwing fireball after fireball after fireball, then Daigo can like think to himself, the next time I'm pretty sure he'll throw a fireball because he, he knows that I, I'm not willing to jump, then I'll jump, right? So let's take a look. Okay, so in this clip, uh, Daigo is Guile, right? And as we watch, he's probably never going to jump towards Ryu. I mean, he's playing Guile, so he doesn't really have to. Uh, let's full screen this. But even though there's a fireball war here, Watson is very, very comfortable just throwing fireballs because Daigo's not going to jump over them. He, he's shown already this entire set that at most he'll neutral jump it or throw his own fireballs back. All right, all right, Sonic boom, Hadouken, Hadouken. And he jumps in after, you know, 60 seconds of in-game time. The timer looks to be a little faster than real life, but yeah. So I think the main takeaway here is that not that you should never jump or try not to jump, but you need good reasons to do it. Don't just yell away. It's a gamble. And I think that's advice that you should take in almost any aspect of fighting games. You might hear people say, you know, don't jump. Don't throw fireballs from this range. Don't press when they're plus. Never take advice like that black and white because you should press when someone's plus sometimes or else they'll just keep being plus. You should throw uh, fireballs from ranges where it's unsafe or else people will never like respect that distance so sometimes you do have to do the quote-unquote bad or risky thing but you need to have a reason for it right you have to have a read you have to notice that someone is stealing more turns when they're plus so you press maybe that's something we'll talk about in the future maybe i got ahead of myself but anyway let's keep going by the way the crucial moment of that final round occurs at the 332 mark <clears throat> that's when daigo was instinctively supposed to jump but didn't Watch the whole round from his perspective and you'll feel an urge to jump at that point. Let's take a look at it again, actually. 332. Right, is that what it said? Yeah. Okay, so Daigo was supposed to jump right about here. Yeah, like, we threw like three, four fireballs in a row, right? <clears throat> it felt like a very good time for him to jump in. So at that point, as Ryu, you're like, this guy just does not want to jump. So that's what convinces Watson that Daigo has no interest in jumping, which prompts Watson to get a little reckless with his Hadoukens. Credit Daigo for being able to detect that exploit, to detect and exploit that subtle psychological shift. Good stuff. Element 14. Set up a cross-up by baiting a sweep at close range. The main tactical advantage here is that it can be executed from within an opponent's sweep range, which it makes it viable nice. tool when you're cornered. Troy and Boss took turns demonstrating this maneuver during the b5 sfa3 winner's bracket final obviously this is something to attempt sparingly after all it requires an irreversible commitment to be based on a predictive whim baiting a sweep isn't exactly easy so save it until 
after you figure out your opponent's sweeping habits. So this applies a little less to recent games because they've made sweeps, like in Street Fighter 4, even Street Fighter 3, uh, sweeping someone as a poke was not a big deal, whereas uh, in Street Fighter 5 and 6 it is. But as you can see, okay, so Sakura's out of range. She whips a button. This might make, she just whips her jab and she's cornered. And Akuma's at a nice range where she could poke back, or he could poke back. She takes that opportunity to jump over him. It doesn't have to be a sweep, but the the idea here is that when you're the one cornered, if you can bait them to whiff something, like we talked about this last time, that when you're the someone who, when you corner someone else, you don't want to let them get out no matter what, right? So as a person who's cornered, you want to bait the person like who has you cornered to whiff something, to kind of feel like they need to do something. The example is a sweep, but it doesn't have to necessarily be a sweep. When you think your opponent is going to come at you with a button at that cross up distance is a very good time to go for cross up because cross cutting DP is not as easy as just normal anti airing. A lot of normal anti airs do not hit cross up very well. So yeah, the point, the point stands, right? Okay, let's get into element 15. Analyze your jump attack ranges and leverage them to construct a mix up. For instance, Zangief's jump heavy punch has excellent reach. If you jump at someone from maximum JHP distance, you can cause their uppercut to whiff by not pressing anything. Let's take a look at what that looks like. Yeah, so if Zangief presses a button here, right, his stand heavy punch reaches very far ahead of him, uh, Sagat has to block it. But if Sagat uppercuts it, he'll hit his arm. But because Zangief did an empty jump, the uppercut whiffs. So something you can do in Street Fighter 6, it happens, I'll show you in a sec. However, I wouldn't recommend trying to play air to ground footsies too often. Not even using a character is equipped with dive kick and air fireballs. Uh, yeah, so like, Kami's more privileged in this, in this instance because of her dive kick, but doesn't mean like you should rely on it, right? Whoever's on the ground always has better options. But if you're up against characters who force you to jump, such as Sagat and Charlie, then Sagat, why'd I say it like that? Then you may as well create some measure of uncertainty for your opponent. Uh, so I have an example here, but let's look at it in game, right? So Kami's jump heavy kick Reaches pretty far ahead of her if I jump from here, I can hit Chun-Li, right? If she tried to anti-air me with This she can't reach me, right? You saw you see that if I jumped in from here. She cannot anti-air me if I empty jump Right she would have to use a different anti-air and uh, th that's something that happens at high level play all the time remember i made this cup a long time ago this is twitch rival right yeah. exactly what I'll we were like just talking that. about but again you know if if guile presses right. a button right here if guile presses any button he will make jp block jp does not want to block so he does crouching heavy punch he wants to anti-air he's like guile why are you jumping at me i got a crouch heavy punch anti-air knuckle do presses nothing and lands right in his face I don't know if you consider this air footsies or whatever, but it's definitely a mix up, right? Like because Guile purposely did not press a button on his jump, J JP's anti-air whip. Now you have to have pretty good knowledge of the enemy uh, character's anti-airs, right? If this was Kami, she cannon spikes you. She doesn't care, but like Kami's pretty privileged in this. Look, look how far this reaches, right? You, you're not empty jumping that unless you're jumping from like here. Even then she might still hit you. <laughs> like, but Kami doesn't have to go that far. Her light cannon strike goes pretty just straight up she also has back medium plunge right so she she covers a long distance with the anti-airs but not every character does like jp I'm starting to realize kami has a lot of tools huh uh let's look at some more examples why do i have a thousand paper so uh, paper. jp has a jump i think it's his heavy kick where he kind of like almost leans horizontally uh and it would hit it would hit kimberly on the way down here but he presses nothing on purpose, and now the Kimberly Crouch Heavy Punch whips. Be horrible for Kimberly because happens a lot. Input. I think uh, Samurai wanted it. I think this one's a little different. I think he actually used an air special. I wanted to bring that up as well, like that. Yeah. So yeah. this is just an example of baiting an anti air in a different way. Obviously, this is Luke specific. He does his aerial move to jump think, over uh, the DP. DP there and it did uh. not come out. Jumps. He's gonna get DP'd if he if he lands on him. What does uh, Mena do? He does Luke's little air special, which makes him go over a DP. Now, if Orange Luke just didn't anti air at all, this move is super, super has long recovery. So he would just get punished on the way down. But Mena knew Samurai would try to uh, DP it. So he dodged it. Kind of like some air footsies, you know? 
So here's what everyone needs to do, yet nearly nobody does. Before you jump, ask yourself what you intend to land on. If your answer is, I don't know, I'm just trying to land a combo, then you're jumping onto an uppercut. Kind of like what we talked about at the beginning, you need a reason for your jumps. You need a reason. Do you, th do you think you know that your opponent will crouch heavy punch and you can space around it by doing an empty jump? Do you think you're positive your opponent will throw a sweep or a long lasting move? Are you expecting Guile to throw a fireball at a very particular spot? And if it's Guile, you might still get uppercut, let's be honest. Anyway, uh, only jump if you know what your opponent's going to do and if jumping is the best counter to their action. That's how to turn the odds in your favor. Couldn't have said it better myself. That's perfect. Okay, so let's talk about chapter four really quick. I think some of this doesn't apply as much to modern games because people don't super as often like okay not as often I'll, I'll talk about it in a second anyway picture this you've been dominating the match you've got a sizable life bar lead you're nowhere near the corner momentum is on your side and all you have to do for a guaranteed win is stay in control for another 15 seconds the only downside the only obstacle in your path is your opponent's fully charged meter what do you do whatever game you happen to play for every single significant character matchup you need eight to ten viable answers to that question ready to go at a moment's notice otherwise you'll find some serious nightmare comebacks waiting for you so zangief has no health here he gets in once gets a super and now he's in the lead and he wins so, you know, supers, they do a lot of damage. Ultras in Street Fighter 4. This might even apply to V-Trigger in Street Fighter 5. But uh, Street Fighter 6, we're mostly talking about supers, right? There's simply no denying the decisive impact of a super move in modern fighting games. If you don't know how to bait your opponent into wasting meter, you may as well subtract the entire thing from your life bar and try to win with whatever you've got left. Not a bright idea. If your opponent has full meter and you can tell they're eagerly fishing to land it, Stay far away for a while, then walk into their crouching medium quick range and immediately block low. It's a relatively safe gamble, and if they take the bait, you can punish them, or at the very least, you'll have neutralized the threat of their super meter. So this is one thing that I don't think applies as much to Street Fighter 6, and I'll talk about why in a sec. But in older games, especially, you know, like Third Strike, this was a huge thing. People would buffer, they would be sitting... Okay, so you know how you, you might buffer crouching medium kick into like drill, right? Very, very normal. And then if they step into the range, you get the drill or the DP if you're bad like me. But in Third Strike, I mean, I don't know about older, older games. I never played them. It's very common to do that same thing with your super, right? So if Kami walks in or Chun-Li walks in, I get my super. Now, it's not that this isn't like reliable in Street Fighter 6, but a lot of people, they're more likely to just do drive rush if they really want it, if they have that, uh, if they have the resource for that. Um, maybe they'll do EX into level two. Like, I don't think... From what I could tell, a lot of people are buffering crouching medium kick into supers in this game because there's just other easier ways to hit supers. Um, but the uh, the idea stands is that you, you're trying to bait someone into wasting it, right? So in this case, Gal was airborne, so the Sagat uh, super whiffed. Let's say I was doing this into super as Chun Li. If she just walked into my range, like if she kind of did this where she, uh, oops. Like just walked into my range and blocked low, she would make my buffer come out and block it. Right? That's one of the things if you notice people are buffering moves, you kind of walk in and immediately block. Let's go to element 11. While on the receiving end of lengthy combos and rush sequences, a lot of players attempt reversal supers at difficult link junctions and possible breaking points. If you've caught your opponent gambling this way and you have a direct counter to their super move, sometimes it's worth while to create an intentional gap during your attack sharing by inserting the appropriate counter. If it works, the advantages are numerous. This is something we talked about last week uh, a bit. Remember when Punk was fighting the JP and he kind of just like stopped his string, even though he hit him? Uh, so he knew JP was mashing super. Now, uh, as I mentioned here, difficult link junctions. I remember reading this yesterday and I was like, are there like... In Street Fighter 4, there's a lot of times where you knew someone had to do a one frame link. And it's not that easy. It's, it might drop it. So you should mash super. Why not? In Street Fighter 6, I feel like there's less times where you feel like someone might actually drop their combo. Maybe I'm underestimating how difficult some characters' combos are. But then, literally, I read this and I thought, does this happen in Street Fighter 6? Like, what, what's the difficult part of people's combos? I don't know. But I guess people just mash super anyway. Because this is what happened to me. Okay, so yesterday, I'm playing. I'm trying to learn Jury, right? So I've played Jury for most of the day. At the end of the day, I say, maybe this was two, three days ago. 
I'm gonna play some Kami. And I was so crusty, okay? I didn't remember any of my combos. I was dropping everything. I stunned this Jamie and I'm trying to kill him, okay? I have three bars and a dry brush. And I do standing medium punch, which is useless on Kami and combos. I mean, not literally, but most of the time. But I was used to doing it all day with Jerry. Lo and behold, this Jamie was mashing super in my combo. Look at this. Stun him. I do crouch heavy punch. Kami has to do crouch medium punch here, but for whatever reason I did stand medium punch. I was playing too much uh, jury all day. And he was mashing. For whatever reason, I still had time to block it. I honestly don't know why that's the case. But uh, I guess uh, this tip works. Now, this was an accident. I'm not trying to claim I thought Jamie would super here, but something to keep in mind. We saw it last week with Punk and JP, right? Where he, like, I think he got a hit and he just didn't care. He just stopped because he knew that the JP was mashing super. Alright, element 12. When an aggressive opponent willingly resets the match by pushing you away, don't spring for the first opportunity to make a major move. It could be a trap. Test the waters by whiffing a single low jab, counter bait, or simply block patiently to see what your opponent has in mind. As luck would have it, both methods were demonstrated in under 10 seconds at EVO 2005 by Afro Legends and Eskill, respectively. Sometimes remaining calm through a tense moment is all it takes to avoid defeat. Uh, before we go into this, this is something that I've done with Kami in the past that I've, I've watched my replays. I'm like, I should stop doing that. I have level three against a character who throw fireballs, okay? I'll like hit one of these or something and I'll just back off. And it, I knew why I was doing it in my head. I'm like, I want that guy to throw a fireball so I could do this, right? Uh, so if you notice other people doing that to you, if you ever see a Kami backdash away from you, what seems like a good position for her, it's because she's waiting for you to throw a fireball. She's like, hey, look how far I am. You should throw a fireball. And she's gonna super through it. Uh, I stopped doing that now because people realized <laughs> it's like don't throw fireballs at level three cami. So I just now kind of take my uh, I, if I land a hit, I'm taking I'm taking everything I can. Right. So let's see what's going on here. Yeah. So DJ whipped a button here. Balrog tried to punish with su a super combo. Didn't work. He did sweep, which is, I would imagine, unsafe. I don't actually know DJ's uh, frame date or anything in this game. And he just did a super right away after, but Balrog waited. So there are ways to bait people to wasting their meter, which is a huge deal. Not only are you not taking that damage, they lost the meter. It's not like Drive Gauge, they'll get it back next turn. Or, uh, I mean, yeah, in, with Drive Gauge, you bait someone to waste it. Maybe they'll waste all of it and go into burnout. Next round, they get it back. If you ever make someone level three super at the end of a round and then you go into the next round, that person is tilted. Okay, they wasted their level three and they didn't kill you and lost the round, they're tilted. Okay, so these examples barely scratch the surface of the countless soup meter bait supers utilized in tournament play. They vary they vary based on character matchups, accounting for the projectiles and objectives, properties and objectives of rival supers. Pick up as many as you can from various sources such as forum discussions, match videos, clever opponents, etc., and try them out yourself. So yeah, it doesn't have to be specifically something we talked about here, but keep in mind the idea of trying to bait people supers. You probably already do this. You know, you're fighting Zangief. He has level three super. He's, he's going to mash it at like a Brandon block string in between your gap or something. So you just jump, right? Or you backdash and he probably still grabs you anyway. But the idea of trying to bait people to waste their super meter is huge. Constantly monitor your opponent's state of mind. Certain aspects of footsies take advantage of an opponent's hesitation while others rely on misdirecting aggression. Thus, ex expecting passiveness from someone who has grown impatient can lead to disaster. As you practice against different players, try to detect which is the psychological stimuli and nudge them in one direction or the other. For example, a flashing guard bar tends to make people jumpy with reversals and trigger happy with supers. This is very similar to uh, being burnt out in Street Fighter 6, right? There's no guard bar, but the drive meter might as well be. Conversely, having no meter against someone with full meter urges people to play it overly safe. Throwing a lot of fireballs lures some people into complacency while agitating others. Learn as many of these habits as possible and factor them into your decisions when choosing from your arsenal of tricks. I love everything said there, you know, mix it up, find out what uh, your opponent like likes to react to and how they do it. I want to make a whole video series on this where I pick up a brand new character. Probably gonna be Ken because I find him fun. And as I go through the lower ranks, I'm just gonna talk while I play. Rather than focusing on the match, I'll just be like, hey, when I throw a fireball, this guy likes to do X. So uh, everyone can see kind of like how to download your opponent. Again, I'm not like the greatest Ken player on the planet, but uh, for a lot of people who are stuck, you know, gold, platinum, diamond, uh, hopefully I could show you what it looks like to try to you know, read your opponents at the ELO. Some people say it's too random. It's probably not. They're probably doing things for a specific reason, right? 
But yeah, I hope you learned something. If you did, I would appreciate a like, comment, and subscription. Uh, let me know what else you guys want to see besides finishing up the FTSE's handbook. Stay beautiful, everyone.